Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 46th live online reading event. We've been doing this now for almost four years, uh, and it never gets old. It always gets better. I'm really excited to introduce this evening. Evening. Um, first by saying that my name is Tom Snarsky and I'm so thrilled and thankful to be here with you welcoming spring on a nighttime note with this evening's reading. In case you haven't listened in before. Performance Anxiety is an online reading series of mostly poetry, but not always poetry. You might hear some fiction and other writing tonight, hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. At each of our events, we feature a group of invited readers to share a selection of their work with us. Having slots for readers every month means we're always looking for folks who'd be interested in reading. So if you are or know a poet or writer who'd be interested in sharing their work at a future event, please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. We always get um, most of our readers from word of mouth and people recommending their friends, and that's always what we like to hear. So if you want to get in touch, we are on Twitter at Performance Anxiety, which is Performance A-N-X-T. You can also just DM, DM or email the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky, T-O-M-S-N-A-R-S-K-Y on Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email me um, at tomsnarsky at gmail.com. Or we have an email for performance anxiety that's uh, poetrybooksontape at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with Kristen Garth, Performance Anxiety's co-founder and other co-organizer, who I'm also very excited to introduce in her capacity as the first reader of the evening. So without any further ado, Kristen Garth is a Pushcart Wrestling nominated sonneteer and a Best of the Net 2020 finalist. She's the author of a short story collection, Daddy, coming this fall from Anxiety Press and many, many, many more books besides. So thank you as always, Kristen, for leading us off. Take it away. <laughs> thank you. Hopefully you guys can hear me, but we'll see. Um, anyway, uh, I have a double sonnet that I was going to read that is um, after the last episode of Succession. So it's, you know, if you are worried about spoilers, maybe cover your ears <laughs> or maybe you won't hear me. So, <laughs> okay, no. but anyway, it's called The Bad Dad Stuff. After Succession, season four, episode four, Honeymoon States. I have my first sexual dream about Kendall Roy after the episode in which he tells his PR guy to air out the bad dad stuff. The team had pitched to bolster the reputations of the successors, but Roman whipping boy, who knows firsthand his father's cruelty, demands another plan than to destroy a father not yet even in a grave. A loyalty of the most wounded and depraved I have related to tried to save off my emerging Kindle, who misunderstands what dad would do to be a way to live. I want to, be to believe like Roman, I forgive. But then I'm hypnotized after the Logan mortality surprise when Kendall switches to let's talk candidly about the man. With strap-on blackmail, a greedy surreptitious underhand, and I close, I close woman childish eyes subconsciously let Kendall bring me to a release in the place in which I prevaricate the least. Be something ruthless in my own defense. No self-effacing gallows humor of the child abused, but comprehend at last the wealth of old men's secrets forcibly compiled inside where there isn't room to keep. Kendall Roy whispers to me in my sleep. And uh, the next poem that I'm gonna read is actually um, one after um, S uh, SVU and for, it's for Richard Belzer who um, died recently. And it's called Munch. Exit a crime scene before becoming chalk lines. Enter a house you pay for, one table dance at a time. A Disney princess bed where you unwind to watch SVU, big screen TV. Crimes they call, especially heinous, resolved in an hour. Your favorite detective is one especially dour, much like the gaunt actor who plays him. Bleak perspective you share. All three abused by family religious, and it makes you cynical, aware of atrocities you cannot unsee. Help but be psychoanalytical as you take off plaid skirts for dangerous men. Then turn on a detective who feels like a friend. And um, the next one I'm gonna read is called The Fear. Already a washed up pageant queen by the second grade. A shiver on the lap of the one who makes you most afraid. 
wise enough to know his dictates are traps whispered into your unpierced ears. You are aging out of grooming and aging into suffering. It's residue, the fear. It becomes another man you learn to service on your knees, plead to in the night, perpetually displease. Though you will try with all your might and bleed for countless human hands, it was not for these, but for the fear, which never leaves you alone, confused with love before any you have known. And um, the next one I'm going to read is called Sex and Ice Cream. Dream last night of a boy who laid you down in immaculate sand to burrow into an emptiness he thinks he's first to have found in places he thought you would be brand new. Gave him a reason to abandon you, not tonight in the sand, in his bed, sprawled out in his SUV, but far away through, um, through the phone where he can't see the baby doll tears, just remembers the lie of your schoolgirl flesh that someday um, Barry, that somebody buried in a lace collared dress, but dug up before it could rest in a relative peace, ceded to him for a season of sex and ice cream, to be the same damaged age each night you dream. And finally, the last one I'm going to read is something, um, some new shit that I just wrote yesterday. Um, um, after I saw this Im image in, uh, I was leaving a Publix and there were, um, black berries that were dropped in like a trail on the parking, in the parking lot. And, um, and this poem came to my head. So anyway, it just shows I'm a weirdo, but anyway, just desserts. Follow a trail of blackberries through the brambles and the dirt. Each thorn that pricks phosphorescent skin is there to ensure you hurt. Nurtured in the darkness to afflict a maiden with its curse. Leave your nightgown on a low-hanging limb and, cr and crawl towards your just desserts. Trespass his haunting grounds, pretending you were the first he lured. So many seasons ago, carefully inured. Fed fruit with his fingers inside a mouth, he directed patiently and torturously slow to open wide, savor blackberries that lead to his front door, pruned until you burst when you can wait no more. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Kristen, for leading us off tonight and for reminding everybody, since I forgot to earlier, that uh, we have a special pension at Performance Anxiety for New Shit. We celebrate the risks that y'all are taking, sharing, you know, raw new stuff. Uh, and it's always cool to start the night off on that kind of note. Um, and that, again, was Kristen Garth leading us off, who you can find on Twitter at Lola and Jolie, L-O-L-A. A-N-D-J-O-L-I-E, and on Instagram at Kristen Ingrid Garth. Um, and you can keep up with Kristen's publications, her journals, all this other stuff that she's always working on um, at KristenGarth.com, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-G-A-R-T-H.com. So cool, with all the uh, tones set and, and ready to rumble into the rest of our reading order, I'm really excited to welcome our second reader of the evening in Caroline Reddy. Caroline Reddy's work has been published in Active Muse, Calliope, Gray Sparrow, International Human Rights Arts Festival, Starline, and Tupelo Quarterly Review, among others. In the fall of 2021, her poem, A Sacred Dance, was nominated for the Best of the Net Prize by Active Muse. And I think, Caroline, you also got some good news recently about uh, yes. a book thing, right? Yes, it just happened um, Saturday. I just got my first contract with Pierin Press for a book that some of these, all these poems are going to be in. Um, it's called Shake the Atmosphere to Reclaim an Empty Moment. So it's all about um, healing from trauma and sort of uh, being in the universe and accepting what comes. So thank you so much, Tom. I'm excited to be here. Thank you all for reading. Um, so this is The Basement of Tehran. Thank you. Uh, this was published in the International Human Rights Arts Festival, and it's going to be a part of a, a collection anthology, uh, Raining Women Speak Out. Hold still, dear child, to that fuzzy blanket until the sirens stop. And when the bombs drop, we have the space beneath us that holds still as we take shelter underneath the loud alarm. And when fear reigns, stop, Azizem. Smell the fresh Nivea scent of your mother's hand. Pull closer to your madar. I tug at my papoosh. 
My childhood blanket has collected neuron memories that can be triggered any second by the latest bombs in Ukraine. I'm an REM trapped by nightmares and st that steal any sense of peace. And as I collapse under the eclipse, I can remember the pieces of another life, a pair of damp skis and the smell of cardamom chai from Nahar, lunch, while remaining a child in hiding, then and now, a displaced refugee in a country that often shouts, go back home. So I will process it step by step before the rumination spirals downwards. Sense, stop and assess, sense, feet touching the moist earth, smooth fingers reaching for the object before me, my gray black life straw water bottle with a wolf howling above, pine trees sprawling at its feet, and mountain peaks rising towards its graceful neck. Just breathe this scene deep and rise upward from belly to throat to crown. I allow myself to sink into the tub and inhale the scent of lavender into my lungs. I let the Epsom salt rinse off these old aches and soothe my nerves for the, silence, for the sound of sirens from the basement of Tehran has been replaced by the sensation of Tibetan singing bowls. Thank you. Um, the next one, I, I did a whole bunch of uh, poems about Iran lately because of everything that's been happening. I don't know if anyone knows. So I'm hoping to use my voice uh, to just raise some awareness. Uh, this is called A Nightingale Reaches a Crescendo. This was published by the Journal of Expressive Writing. When our, so when our soil and soul began to fade, we trapped a nightingale in a cage. I stood stained in remorse, forgetting about Farsi and the city. You cried through protests and blood-soaked streets. I mourned my true identity beyond my duties and a thousand cypress trees. You served those who did not deserve your baked hands. I rebelled against your code. When you brought spirits, I created a chord and freed ghazals from the tomb of Hafez. Her songs carried our voice into the stars. The night sky roared. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks. This one is kind of uh, songs of uh, Koknus. Koknus is like the phoenix of Bird of Iran. And this is just kind of about having hope for the spring and the divine feminine energy um, coming out, hopefully. Songs rise from the ashes as Koknus burns away debris of thistles and last bits of sterile soil from the chambers of my heart. The spring equinox brings noruz as I tumble through tombs and burst from beneath the snow like a lustrous tulip. I recite poetry and swing on wings of origami doves that allow my mind to bring back memories from the wind. I was once adorned in green bands, beaming up the sky with love and hope as we cheered for peace at Cafe Nottery and beyond Washington Square Park. I breathe into dandelion seeds as a turquoise egg emerges and cracks open. Donya wraps around us as the phoenix burns our sorrows so we can emerge as star seeds, bringing forth divine feminine energy. Thank you. Um, this is a sacred dance, which was uh, uh, nominated for Best of the Net from Active Muse. Twirling in a tattered tribal scarf and an empty room, I remember the empress flame that lit the embers of an old Sufi heart. I dream of a womb where the ashes of a wounded bird do not spoil. Perhaps it has been abandoned in a crypt, hidden beyond cypress trees and tiger lilies to serve me now. Reserve these shimmies and protect lost goddess shakes through maddening masquerades in this dan sacred dance of stillness and shifting space. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is Sanctity of the Muse. I'm not sure how much uh, time I have. Just let me know if I'm going over anything. This is Sanctity of the Muse. Uh, this was published in Calliope. I anoint, well, thank you. <laughs> I anoint my wrists with lavender oil and lay my head upon a pillow allowing these stardust desires and the singing bowls to chime, ringing in the early morning sun. The last notes of Orpheus please Morpheus's dreams of the night. I wake into a vision of infinite soundscapes and welcome the notion of a cosmic rotation, weaving words in an ethereal voice to illuminate geometric shapes that whirl beyond the constellations. A nightingale reaches a crescendo and I'm sound again. We can embrace this new ritual and feel the Elysian fields as a lyre plays in our hearts and poetry lingers in our soul. We can transcend the realms and enter an eternal gate as we gather in a celestial sphere and sing the sanctity of the muses. 
Um, this is how about like music basically has saved my life many, many times in my life. Um, and I think I'm going to read maybe uh, a few more. Uh, okay, this is um, The Lost Tribe. Uh, this was in Deep Overstock. I never knew that the name... I'm sorry. I never knew that the name Osei Afrifa was one of royalty until a classmate whispered, you are of noble blood. But I had be been, I'm sorry. But I had been beaten and belittled that I didn't believe in my own myth. For years, as I slept wide awake until I felt stars of Anansi and listened to the Djembe drum, I danced in the astral realm and asked the Ashanti ancestors to create kente cloth so I could be clad in a regal robe. I asked the elders to create a ritual ceremony as I cleared the battlefields. I soared above prairies and sought safaris that could purify spears and swords. I learned the ancient Akindra symbols and sought wisdom that would be sown into my cells as I reclaimed my name, Nana Koya, and the Golden Stool. Thank you. And the last one is a bit fun. It's more of a sci-fi poem. This is um, Star Beings Chronicle. I had a lot of fun writing this one. Uh, Bethlehem Round Table, I think it was published in. I thought about this book as I was floating on the surface of a bubble, human etiquette for a new world. By the way, there are so many concepts besides why a bride never gets to relax that I don't understand the imbalance of power, the brutality of war, destruction of our planet, and why humans settle for a life that isn't truly theirs. I decided to write my book to help humanity, a star being's chronicle. I hope you get past the importance of hydration and skip the advice on first dates and flip the pages to the section, how to measure your mission when soul, the main engine of your domain has crashed. My own began years ago when the doors of a zendo led to a dojo. All that bowing, breathing and blocking beckoned me to activate my DNA and work with a light body healer to serenade my cells and travel through the dimensions. I thought wishing on stars was silliness, but manifestation is not a sham. Those ideas sometimes disappear into the atmosphere, but a few are captured by comets sent to the meteorologist and dispatched through bursts of sunbeams that pour through our pores. I also have these enchanted map cards that are quite handy as I loop back and forth through space and time, reliving harsh moments that get triggered by the mere scent of laundry detergent. When your life reboots your plans, shift out of your comfort zone, sift through the timelines of your life, lift your body to the skylights as you shed lesser forms. I know that this office desk thing was not your ideal career. You wanted to swim with dolphins and decipher their alien language or become an anthropologist and travel to New Zealand to study the Maori culture. Instead, you're feeling confined and itchy in your human suit. You can borrow my steampunk spacesuit and see if it fits. Maybe the titanium seeds can reveal the right chemical reaction to free your true nature so you can dance with your photons in the coast of Papua New Guinea and smile at the yellow-lipped sea crate. Thank you. This is kind of really about getting my life back together and getting back to writing. So that one last one is kind of like leaving teaching and doing what I love. So it was a lot of fun to write. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Carolyn. And thank you for taking us on a journey all over the world and also through the dimensions. That was a really, really cool scale to, to operate on. And that, again, was Caroline Reddy, who you can find on Twitter at Caroline Reddy 2, C A R O L I N E R E D D Y 2. Um, and Caroline's website is carolineready.com. And again, keep an eye out for that wonderful book that's coming out um, from Pure and Springs, Pure and Springs Press, excuse me, uh, in the future. So that's going to be really, really cool. Um, I'm really excited to move into almost the halfway point of our reading order. Um, we have a few readers who are coming to us um, with sort of like a multimedia bent, like readers who are poets and other things. Um, and so I'm excited to sort of see how that plays out in our next few sets. And the first um, group of, or first pair of readers rather, I'm excited to introduce next in our reading order are Anne and Kirby Kenny. Twin sisters Anne and Kirby Kenny are American-born writers and artists. Their work will appear in the first edition of Hell of Fame magazine, as well as the forthcoming issue of Ghost City Review. Ghost City is well represented on this call tonight, which is awesome. 
Their debut collection, New Myths, which I'm really excited reading now and working on a blurb for, will be available in the fall of 2023. They're also screenwriters developing two limited series projects and an animated short. So Anne and Kirby, thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. I'm so excited to hear what you're going to read. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Okay. Melody, why did I choose you, choose you, choose this? In our moving house where lungs breathe and hearts form, you chase a storm. Standing in the basement, light breaks. Tensions boom like thunder in the sky. Form where the mothers fly, and where the birthday saris in your month lie, the revenge is real. The world yells, and terror stirs where the wind yowls. Black, but then your gaze, touching sweetness, and I'm all right. Somehow you open, now, 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 to this. See, in this fury, you learn a lesson that hums like the wind's wake. Raucous it thuds and holds your own man in it. You create another day. It is within, deep within where we choose each other as women. You are. The new world starts. You, you, brought the storm, but you ended it too. Okay, so that's the first one. <laughs> okay. The reason do you know how often the hours hover around your arrival? The children stay quiet. You are the massive threat. Are you aware of that? I know, I know. It's easier to yell and barrel down the hall. But your mad nature revolves in spite of reason. The broken nature of your promise shows now enough hiding the injury the heart knows somewhere deep you know you wield amen you want heaven but it knows nothing of you okay foxes I left her. I couldn't stand to look. I went hours into night, denying myself. My feet stamping to the who calls of wild dogs and the screams of the fox skulk. When I showed back up, the room was empty. Something took the baby away. I don't know what. Its shadow, still near, forms the sly jaws of fear. Okay. And this is my last one, and I'll give the floor to my sister. Majesty. Touch my hand, though such immensity terrifies. It is new, and I don't know it. I only know the whole, that large branch that broke off and pulled at my eyes. You broke off the north side. You gave me a body. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I'll start with my selection. An indulgence. 
The votive hugs itself. It flickers. It belongs to someone else. Its fine, delicate fire burns away all reason. The boy and I went up in flames. We played and got a little rough. We broke a lamp, damn candle stand. We challenged God. We indulged. To the basement, brick a brac of plastic, teacups and Santa faces. Do you offer the crying baby special? To the dark booth, touching, not blackness. My voice carries through caves. He is ripped to shreds and scattered. The blood-stained hands of water, the untold truths scream to be felt by him. His marked body unmasks the clergy. I converse, I walk, I go to sleep, I hold him. Now my second poem, Mirrors. I mean, it's not technically mine. Like We wrote and edited both of these, but the, I'm reading it. Okay, Mirrors. I got whacked in the barn with a book. Heard the black leather thump. I felt the first evil, rough as jute. And saw its reflection in my face. I wore the second evil as a slip. Its stooges closed in, then led me to a padded room. They came with drawing paper to shape my body into something else, to scramble my DNA. Their purple robes shimmered pig hearts. With a cackle, they had me shimmering, a pig-nosed bat in an overcoat. Glimmering, amorphous, talking to fish. Now their bodies are gone. I feel the third evil in face checks and chicken skin. My devilish mind keeps me on the wall, waiting. In glass, my image lashes out, nasty as skin. My reflection lives, haunts, drags me as a whole-heeled Hector. Only in my red-hearted holes does warmth show. I hear the fourth evil whistle his suicide note. His wings fold when resting, but now they are spreading and shoving all hope into the fountain of his soul. I stare into a mirror with the ingredients of life lovingly, carefully drawn on my face. The red and white form a passage. The hazy reflection stutters, then shakes wildly to free itself. Next to me, that cougar pelt. Its hunting story knows fire and the passion to hold life. In that mirror is myself. I'll love her like I love no one else. And then my last poem, Hey Katie. I looked back and suddenly saw how the condition was, how elemental how heaven and hell rest within notions. Oh, pink element, help me heal. The body will heal when the mind does. I give you my girdle, protect my body. I will binge your gifts, I will wed. How pink and white this new shroud is. How open to the world, 
a little on the bed. That's it. Thanks everyone for Thanks. listening. Wow, thank you so much, Anna Kirby, for that lapidary Vatic journey through some new myths. Um, <laughs> that again was Anne Kirby Kenny, who you can find on Instagram at Anne and Kirby World, A N N A N D K I R B Y W O R L D. Um, again, they are multi talented poets, screenwriters, doing lots of things, but keep a particular ear to the ground for new myths, which will be available in the fall of 2023, um, and also some forthcoming stuff from the Ghost City Review. So we're really excited to know that that's in the pipeline, and we're so glad that you shared it with us tonight. Wow, yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal first half of our reading order. Um, and I'm really excited to get to our Keystone reader right in the middle of the lineup tonight. Um, also someone I got to know through Instagram, which I'm like very grateful for Instagram for many reasons, um, many poetry related reasons. Uh, and that is Abby Holderson. Abby graduated from art school, Maryland Institute College of Art in MICA in 2020 with a BFA in fine arts and has been focusing on various creative projects, including short filmmaking. So we've got more filmmakers on the docket tonight. She loves way too many things, poetry being one of them. She hasn't done anything like this reading before, but she's super excited to hear everyone's art. And Abby, we're so excited that you're sharing yours too. Thank you for being with us. Take it away. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> awesome. So um, a lot of my poetry has been like enclosed in journals throughout like two years and to now, and I am just excited to be able to show it to some other people, not annoy my friends too much. <laughs> um, I thought I would share four pieces that kind of go together in a way. Um, yeah, so I'll just start. This one's called The Houses They Burn in January. The man, just like any other, stokes the fire inside, a cozy wooden cabin. It's the north woods and outside it's a most uncaring cold. A woman sleeps soundly on the bed, inside the warm cabin, the hearth next to her feet. The man, just like any other, thinks the sleeping woman looks peaceful, he knows when she wakes up, they may argue or dance or cry or love. A sudden disgust wrinkles his brow. He is now holding more pieces of wood. The man, just like any other, slowly piles the fire food high and low next to the woman's long tresses, her belly, her legs. He lights this creation, which is poorly designed with his father's lighter. The man, just like any other, drapes a rope over the woman's body for decency, he suspects. The well-kept hearth is now expanding. As it burns the woman's hair, she screams as her slumber was disturbed, and now the man is nowhere to be found. The man, just like any other, forgot his coat. She made it for him out of some sort of animal. His hands are numb and dry. The city is not for miles. The sting of winter erodes his face and his muscles tense. The woman, who is now very much awake, weeps as she pours snow over the inferno of the now blackened cabin. It is presently damp inside. The woman climbs back into bed, covers herself in soot, and tries to sleep again. And now we have another poem called The Woman Who Laughs, which I did a year prior to that poem. The Woman Who Laughs does so in secret rooms, perceives her reflection, possession in bloom. The woman who laughs invites herself in. Come here, she utters, feverish lips slim. The woman who laughs smiles crudely at this. She wears fearsome masks to await suitor's kiss. She prays from love's cast, he enters her chambers. Abrading her skin, his cloak easily angers. The woman who laughs unfastens doors to burn the old waves as they wash her to shores. The woman who laughs can finally rest, as in her bed, as in her dress. The woman who laughs dirties her garb, cauterized vacant, as was her love devoted and ancient. 
the woman who laughs finally drowns back flow of earth so speak her sounds she gurgles she spits charred clean papery pulp to the soul of a lover spun into portal let out the woman now ceases creation halting her laughing she conjures lamentation her grin exposes furious teeth to melt his biting scent buried neatly beneath the woman who laughs politely requests the barrier open so she can protest in closing secrets whispers discreet a finality and a reason to meet inferno churns and bellowing froth sear through her pillow a flame to a moth the woman who laughs mystery is revealed the man's intentions were perfectly sealed transcending and sinking she floats into dusk the woman who laughs cries very much and so then this is a more light-hearted one <laughs> second to last uh in the vein of sisyphus as seems to be in the consciousness lately <laughs> it's called um one must imagine sisyphus happy one must imagine sisyphus happy as he cradles large metal bowls up carpeted stairs full of trinkets rubber masks and house plants up to his new flat which he hesitates but secretly suspect is no longer limbo well at least no longer an airbnb in racine a young woman prances beside him draped in a fur coat and and an oversized coin purse which doubles as apothecary she chats his ears off questions and quips complaints and observations she hopes that he's listening to some of it often the young woman scans his face hell is other people and gosh he hardly knows the gal interestingly though sisyphus feels it's been ages since they've met all of it is strange perfectly non-linear perfectly five minutes late he blinks slowly accepting these queer facets time in a midwestern inferno is wrinkled he smiles especially when she does though sisyphus and the young woman are becoming tired knackered by many skunk smelling treks up and down those felted flights just one more trip to the car he declares they have a night out to look forward to she reminds him truthfully and for many reasons he almost planned to call it off the fruits of his labor should be solitary he bravely admits because right now he could be fiddling with the feng shui or opening amazon boxes by a dimly lit salt lamp in the corner of this squeaky clean clean and courageously blank studio sisyphus continues that the only noise beside him could be the highway close to the large window no sweet nothings no opinions from a vibrant other no unknown desanctified church party to dress up for but that night sisyphus decided to say fuck it on his new mattress where the young woman tucked an erotically charged bible verse under his pillow after she left his in progress domain the morning after sisyphus arrived home one must imagine he is a bit scared one must imagine he wants to plan more one must imagine he does not at all one must imagine he dreams of her one must imagine him in hell with the girl he likes and somehow the bowl or the boulder could make him blush and here is a final poem that is very short i wrote it last night it is called um, Advice for the Bereaved. Advice for the bereaved. Send real flowers. Swallow real food. Pick up a hobby, but not too soon. Talk to the living. Don't shout at the dead. Make yourself smaller. Get out of your bed. Advice if this fails. Hold an invisible face. Clasp invisible hands, savor invisible embrace. Snore on invisible chest. Laugh with invisible ears. Wear your invisible best. Just until the invisible has finally left. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Abby, for that journey and those four interlocking pieces. It was wonderful to hear your work, and we we're very, very glad to have you on. That again was Abby Holderson, who you can find on Instagram at ominous underscore Abby, O-M-I-N-O-U-S underscore A-B-B-Y. And keep an eye out because uh, hopefully charged by the energy of this reading and all the blowing up of the chat that was happening while you were reading, um, we'll see those poems somewhere. Uh, soon, and that will be very exciting. Um, it's always a little bit bittersweet to get to the back half of our reading order, but um, I'm really excited because the next three readers are all wonderful, um, and a couple of whom have some connections to one another and to Kristen and all kinds of other stuff. So I'm so excited to hear their work. And the first of them who I'm excited to introduce is Paige Johnson. Paige Johnson is editor-in-chief of Outcast Press, which specializes in transgressive fiction, like our book Slut Vomit, an anthology of sex work. Paige Johnson is also author of Percocet Summer, which is first in a four-part series called Seasonal Disasso or Dissociation, excuse me, Poetry for Distancing Dates and Doses. Paige, thanks for being with us. I'm really excited to hear um, our first representation, but not the last of Outcast tonight. Take it away. Hello, thank you. Um, Kristen is also actually in this book, Slut Vomit, an anthology of sex work. Um, so am I, and so is Sebastian, who will read next. Um, 20 stories about sex work, all the varying good and bad, everything in between. So, um, but I'm actually going to be reading, that's our second anthology. I'm going to be reading from our first called In Filth It Shall Be, Shall be Found. Um, and I believe Sebastian will also be reading from that one. Um, so let me pull it up. My piece is called The Blue Hour. It's also about um, a stripper. Uh, that's, that sex work is something I write a lot on. Um, so let me pull this up. Okay, it's called The Blue Hour. Okay. Strip club selfies, the last I'll ever take. Okay, now my cat's away. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm setting up my webcam so I can hang up my fishnets, trade them for cat ears and knee highs to become the ultimate e whore. Gamer girl by day, cam doll by night, twitch thought, chatterbait titty. Sorry. Ah, my page. Oh, you got a cat too? I see that. Okay, trade them in. Um, to I'm so sorry. <laughs> Gamer girl by day, Kim doll by night, Twitch thought, chatterbait titty streamer, simp princess of YouTube, whichever flavor of prostitution pays the best without contact. No more club fees, cat fights, scheduling conflicts, or creepy customers. So color me content. I'm so jelly, sissy says, waving out our Polaroid from her kawaii pink Fuji film. She must have borrowed it from her daughter, who's kinsin... I cannot scroll on this thing. You know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read it straight out of the book then if it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> she must have borrowed the camera from her daughter since she was hoarding tips for her quinceanera last month. You're gonna reel in a million followers, a million bucks, and I'm stuck in this small pond. Sissy glances around the dusky club, grimacing at a ham planet eating sushi with his bare hands. Wish I didn't care about anonymity. I say, I wish you could collab sometime. I'll miss your pretty face. I kiss her cheek, careful not to smear the blush, bronzer, or highlight. Plus, I hear girl-girl scenes pull the most views. No way, girly. Don't need my identity plastered all over the internet. Those sites are crawling with kids, gaming or otherwise. I'd be outed in a second by one of Olivia's schoolmates. Sides, the only game I play is solitaire. I nod, taking hold of our picture. Two smiling faces beneath the scarlet lights. Two tiny brunettes who go too heavy on the eyeliner. No need for bunny ears. We're wearing our own plus detachable cuffs and collars for tonight's Playboy theme. Sissy laughs at the photo, tapping at people in the background. The bartender yawns next to a lonely Guido. The latter leans into one hand, stretching his eye into a pointy little slit. He wears his hair in a pompadour fade, buttoned down loose black at the shoulders and fading to white at the bottom like a spent cigarette. Amongst our, our slubby clientele, he stands out like an oversaturated image. Sissy says, Polydor, 
Uh, yeah. Polly D from Jersey Shore has fallen on tough times, eh? She jokes, nudging me towards the bar. Looks more like a mob boss nursing a breakup, I say. Easy money. You can take the loud assholes on the left. I throw my eyes to the hooting bachelor party sitting center stage, tossing crumpled bills at the new girl. She stops and starts grinding on the pole, unsure if she should take the money now or wait until Doja Cat stops playing. Uh, maybe help a sis out. Newbie might not know how to say no when the wolves ask for extras. Gotcha, chicky. On it. Good luck working, Mr. Mafia. Have fun taming the pack, I say. Maybe you can pickpocket something good. One time, I got fresh AirPods. I stuff our photograph in my bustier and head towards my mark. Along the way, I steal a spritz of vanilla perfume off the DJ booth. The corner bar drowns in cyan light, its tiered shelf the focal point, liquor bottles seemingly glowing from within. At $15 a martini, they should illuminate the room, eliminate a bad mood. Must admit that's my job too, at least for another half hour. Slinking behind the slumped Italiano, I say, You sure are a pretty boy, but are you really bored by a bunch of half-naked girls? He turns around, all smirk and shrug. Pretty boy, I see why you wear glasses. I adjust the oversized frames. They're an aesthetic choice, actually, so the compliment's genuine. He glances about to ask if, as if to ask if anything can be authentic in a place like this. Guest standards are set pretty low with tourists sporting Donald Duck tees, but thanks. Not to brag, but I'm usually surrounded by naked women. There's a vibrance to his pool blue eyes. Must up be sauce to the gills like most of our clients. A squat glass fizzes in his hand, a silver can to his side. Diet cola, like my mom drinks. I bite my lip so I can't laugh, thinking about mom sipping slim fast on a soap opera bender. Oh, so you're a regular, a club connoisseur? Back in New York, I'm guessing, from your accent. It's calm and nasally like a noir broadcast. I hear the law doesn't require pasties and panties up there. No wonder you're yawning down here in the sunshine state. Ah, that's not it. Left Brooklyn years ago. My hometown buddies, he nods toward the rowdy group spellbound by Sissy's gyrating, they flew down to party because one of them's getting married. So they're all boozing, Disney cruising, and gambling at the Hard Rock. I'm just third wheeling. Well, more like I'm the spare tire that that fell off the back and nobody's noticed yet. His gaze, his gaze shifts between me and the bubbles, thankfully. I sit next to him, motion for the barkeep to bring me a gin and tonic. So let me get this straight. You're not into bare naked ladies, theme parks, or frat trades. Got it. I wink as the bar back drops a slice of lime into my drink. Don't get me wrong on the first count, he says. I'm just burnt out from photographing them all day. With their consent, I hope. My tongue peeks out from behind my lips as my drink arrives. I taste like Vaseline and Belvedere. His first time laughing. It's squealy and infectious, like a cartoon character. I see why he keeps it under wraps, but enjoy its warmth. I'm no peeping Tom, he says, but there's a gray area. I slow the stirring of my cocktail. Oh, have I been your secret muse all night? You've been taking snaps of me taking snaps? He smiles at his soda. Trust me, you don't want me taking your photo. I'm a morgue photographer. Sexy, I laugh. Glad I haven't taken a shot to come out my nose. I didn't know morgues needed photographers. I mean, photo ops for the dead? Seems a little gratuitous. I shake my head, banishing my flattening curls from sheeny shoulders. Who wants the pictures? Fetishists? Doctors in training? Newspapers? Nah, nobody that exciting. More like lawyers, insurance companies, and toxicologists. You see, you have to document every step of an autopsy to look for signs of foul play or malpractice. Then, you edit the copy to look more presentable for the family who has to identify the body. Then comes the fun part, like photoshopping bullet holes into moles. Damn, and people think I have a gruesome job. Eh, both of us deal with stiffs every day. He slips the bartender a 20 for my drink. Is what it is. Pays the bills. You like it, Annie? I watch him shift like there's a mouse scampering under his shirt. You can be candid. I can still find you hot if you th- you're into the science of it. Like, I thought dissecting frogs in middle school was cool. Especially when I hid the guts around the classroom to get back at the teacher who flunked me for attendance. Who knew each organ would be a different candy color? Don't worry. You can't scare me. I'm a true millennial. What's that supposed to mean, he asks, 
Something about recessions or 9-11? I mean, that doesn't help, I say. But I was talking about being raised by the internet. My brothers used to show me live leak videos. You know, like a modern form of teasing. You cry at this car crash and you're a baby. But after a while, the brutality turns boring. That's life. Get over it. Like with the shooting streamed on Facebook, that the news shows are um, on Facebook or the news shows. Um, not like I was looking for any of it, but that shit circulates, you know? This makes me wonder if I'll ever get as many hits camming as an ISIS beheading on Twitter. Maybe if I wear something as meme-worthy as a Pepe the Frog mask, though. He rolls his eyes, tittering. Geez, I wonder what desensitized us before social media in the 24 hours news cycle. I'm sure every generation has their specialty. I shrug. Oh. Hell, I remember watching cops beat the shit out of Rodney King in the 90s. Seen a carjacker blow his brains out live on Fox News, too. Me and all my buddies would sing along to Hey Man, Nice Shot, not knowing it was about a politician's public suicide. He shakes his head. Madness. I take a swig off my drink. Smells like pine. Tastes perfectly bitter. If it bleeds, it leads. At least, that's what I heard the lead singer of Twisted Sister say. Way of the world, but don't deflect. Do you dig doing it? Getting to immortalize corpses and photos? Of course it's messy and depressing, but what are the good parts? Health benefits, great pay, discounted coffins? He shrugs. I suppose the job feels like getting in on a secret. It's sort of a privilege to know what happens after you die. How they milk you and stitch you up. Drain you of fluids. Send them off for testing. Hose you down. Dress your wounds, then doll you up for the big party that is your funeral. All in all, I guess it's kind of comforting to know so many people have a vested interest, care, to find out your story. As gory as it, get, as it is to get there. That's a neat way to look at it. Optimistic, even. You're helping people, too. Finding out the truth. Giving families closure. I caress his arm, trying to peep at his, brand, his watch brand. Valentino, Diesel? I wonder if Patrick Bateman would approve. I'm not the one with the cap with the scalpel, he says, finishing his Pepsi. All I do is click, click, click. Sunday will put my camera to better use, though. Gino's paying me to film his wedding ceremony. It's my side hustle to keep sane. Corpses, Monday through Friday, wedding, weddings on the weekend. What a difference a few days make, I say. Tell me stop. Um, I guess I'm just going to stop there because it can be kind of long. And my cat really doesn't want me to continue. But that's like a third to a half. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paige, for that, for the cat cameo and for the uh, Polish vodka representation, which uh, you don't get <laughs> Belvedere in stories every day. So that was that very was cool. A beautiful bottle. I used to work in a liquor store, so... <laughs> I'm glad you agree. It's like one of my, you know, the proudest pieces of my Polish heritage. Um, but that was Paige Johnson, who I'm very, very glad was able to join us. Uh, Paige is on Twitter at Outcast Press One. So Outcast, O U T C A S T P R E S S number one. Um, and keep an eye out for Citrus Springs, which will be her second illustrated poetry yeah. book, in addition to those awesome. Outcast Press anthologies that Paige mentioned. Um, we're not done hearing, I don't think, from the Outcast Press anthologies because our next reader is also an Outcast Press, uh, actually co-founder, and that is Sebastian Weiss. Sebastian Weiss, in addition to being the co-founder of Outcast Press along with Paige Johnson, um, dabbles in poetry, but mostly writes transgressive fiction, noir, and horror. So Sebastian, thank you for being here with us. I'm really excited to hear what you're going to hit us with. Take it away. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, actually, Paige, I'm gonna need your input on this. You threw me off. I didn't think you were gonna read from the filth one, which is fine. So I'm gonna have you vote. Do you want me to read the piece from Slut Vomit about the failed porn star, the one from Anxious Nothings all about eating ass? Or do you want me to read my um, piece about the guy who is sexually aroused by fire? Or I could do my poetry book. What do you think, Paige? Got to unmute your shit. Um, I, um, I think you should do this one versus the filth one or the anxious nothing one. Whatever one maybe is tinier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't practice those ones. Might be rough. All right. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, so this is, and Kristen Garth is in this too, slut vomit. 
All right, so let me just make sure I don't want to go over the time limit. Just kind of double check. All right, here we go. Now, I didn't practice this, so if it's a little bit rough, hopefully you'll, you'll forgive me. The greatest show on earth. The name's Nicole, but most of the world views me as a come-stand angel from the golden age of porn. I starred in high-class film -like films like Women of Influence, just to budget films like Anal Annihilation 1 and 3. You see, some are called to the ministry, others to serve their community, and, and even more to artistic endeavors. Me, I'm called to make men blow, blow their loads, plain and simple. Plenty of people look down on my profession, but I do the shit their wives won't, relieve the stress of men who matter so the world can turn a little easier. My agent saw the potential in me from the get-go, but said my name sounded a little generic, so we spitballed before landing on before landing on Anal Annie. Before then, I was a backdoor virgin. A few hundred bucks that turned into thousands, that turned into DVD covers, changed my mind. It didn't. It didn't take long for directors to refer to me as as an anal queen, uh, penetrated as regularly as a communion kid. I was sitting pretty, if not sorely satisfied. Sadly, the porn industry, uh, as, as I knew it, physical media, audio production, contract girls, is on its last third leg. So I'm reduced to a different kind of performance art. Dis, dis, dismembering corpses for a theater of John, John Wayne Gacy wannabes to whack off to. No shit. Not exactly where I saw my career veering, but... I love the LA lifestyle a porn star, a porn salary provides and hate all the people clogging up the Hollywood freeway. So another dirty compromise. They say this kind of work is for lesser girls. Those who lack the finesse to take a 12, to, to take 12 inch cocks up, up 12 inch cocks with grace. But to make it in this line of work, a woman needs a certain and, and a uh, sequa. The, the, cavadier, uh, the cadaver connoisseurs still appreciate the juxtaposition of guts smeared on a well-kept lady. A bitch, who, a, a bitch who scalps society's slugs with, uh, with the smile of a senator's wife. Me? I do it in a fresh pair of nylons and platinum extensions. Brandishing a scalpel, I begin with a circular incision around the left leg. The patrons love it when I take my time, allowing them to edge. With surgical precision, I cut through muscle and fat until I strike bone. Blood squirts like a uh, like a scream queen, drenches me up to the elbow like a show, uh, like showgirl gloves. I always say you can tell the life of the life someone led from their corpse, their their story laid out before me, like a character like a char uh, caricature spread. Delicious morsels of sadness and snoo for wolves to feast on. The type of corpses that come my way are tattooed by turmoil, showcase bruises, show, uh, showcasing bruised up heroin veins, blackened teeth, gang symbols, gunshots, and stab wounds. A symphony of a broken life graphically painted over flesh and bone. A closed circuit camera zooms in for a high def shot of the protruding femur. The mix of whites, the, the mix of whites, pinks, and reds uh, reminds me of the beautiful garden I'd, I'd stare at one day once I rack up enough cash to live up on a big Hollywood hill. Some patrons offer to buy this footage, but after the guards work them over, they rarely ask twice. And if they do, they get their body bag zipped for the next show. The theater is exclusive, meaning you have to know someone to get in. And even then, we need dirt on you. The, uh, the standard entrance fee is kitty porn, and er invariably for the snuff genre, linked, linking the patron to the act. As gruesome as, uh, as what we do is, we'd fare better in prison, we, we'd, we'd fare better in prison than a pedophile would. Before the blood dries, I rub it on me, lathering it like lotion. Stephen, Stephen King's carry meets a Shine Mac shower scene. The patrons love a bloody girl, sometimes too much. So Tony supplies three guards 
two uh, posted on either side of the stage and a roamer through the aisles. Every few weeks, a patron will sneak in a camera or try to rush the stage like some crazed fanboy. And next day, cops will find him spread out across, uh, spread across three dumpsters or brutalized by an, ad- by an animal in a Mojave desert hole. Yes, some law enforcement and paper boys make up, make up our consumer base, so it makes things a little easier to clean up. Corpses are easy to come by, as Tony's office is a few blocks from Skid Row, and he claims to have a hookup with the local coroner. Some rich bitch goes missing after overdosing on, on coke, and cops ask questions. But if you snag a hooker or a junkie, n- n- nobody thinks twice. People, uh, people drop like stocks on Skid Row, and Tony makes sure the coroner sends me the best of the worst. Not, not too beaten up, preferably a young female with limbs fully attached. Uh, the true best, uh, the true best families ask too many, the, the, the true best families ask too many questions. Nobody questions the coroner when he says the body has been donated to a medical school. The house lights are off and are, are off. So my eyes aren't subject to, aren't subjected to the crowd. The ugly bunch of pud pullers and, and wood that, that would divide their time between bridges and bus stations if it weren't for daddy's money. But their moans and grunts are audible. Clicking the bone saw, it hums like a, like a midget chainsaw or an old school vi- vibrator. I twirl it like a cock tease, doing a catwalk uh, dance around the corpse, the scarlet uh, starting to harden on the both of us. I trust that's, that's not the only hardening thing as I shimmer, as I shimmy out of, out of my clingy white Nighty. Logan, as a hair thin straps fall, I wink to no one in particular. Maybe my future self, uh, maybe, maybe my future self when I never have to scrape bone marrow from under my manicure again. Seamlessly strutting in, in, in six inch high heels while kicking away blood clotted uh, satin, that's the real talent. I never publicly admit. Uh, I, I, I slipped on the spill before, but looking, but looking at me now, you'd probably get, you'd probably guess it anyway, completely nude, drenched in blood, like it's uh Nuru gel. I return to the sculpture. Red coats my face as the spinning blood, uh, grinds a bone. Funny. It looks like a doctor's head mirror when you see it in car, car, cartoons. I pretend to enjoy it, rubbing more blood between my breasts and thighs, swirling it around my Pilates toned stomach and ass. I let out an orgasmic scream as the as the inked limb severs at the hip, separating the crescent moon tattoo looks more like horns. Holding up the dripping leg like a Shakespearean skull, my Broadway bow ends the first act. In an hour, the other leg, arm, head, and clothes will be laid out on the floor for the, uh, for, for the clean and crew to claim. Then the floor will be mopped and another fresh corpse will await. For now, at intermission, I blow kisses to the, uh, to, uh, I blow kisses as the audience claps. I retreat backstage to wash down two Oxycontin with some blue label whiskey. Darlings, I say to the makeup costume girls, have a bleach shirt ready. They nod and I step into the shower. Hot jets hit hit me as pink slithers down the drain, like squirmy little worms and slinking snakes. The pills and boot and booze slam my brain, stilling the shaking of my shoulders and knees. Only a couple more years until I can rebrand as a MILF and do regular gigs again. I may be the best corpse cutter in Tinseltown, but I'm not cut out for this. Now, do I have time to read another section or am I over my time? I don't I want to respect the time. Um, historically, we, I have never, uh, I, don't, I usually don't say uh, that you need to stop at any particular point. So if you would like to read um, something else, by all means, I'm covering Mackerel's ears, so he's good over here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just don't want to violate any kind of rules. So maybe I'll stop there and plug something that hasn't sold well, if it's okay. Uh, again, I'm... I'll do the anxious nothings, which is, I think, a little more humorous. And I will just read just the opening section from this. 
um, that is put out by Anxiety Press. Uh, Cody Sexton, awesome guy. All right. A pervert's guide, a pervert's guide to, an, to an, analingus. Everybody has their obsessions, has their obsession and fantasies, and rarely do they live up to reality. That's the nature of fantasy, right? The image constructed between the years is always different than reality. Some might even contend that when fantasy merges with reality, it ceases to be fantasy and something is taken from you. Cuckolding is one of the most common types of porn. How many people would stick their hands, would, would stick you their hands to those videos, would also want their wife drilled by someone else? People told me how awesome 69, how, how awesome 69 was. For years, I played out scenarios in my head. Every jerk of my dick was the 69 porn, girl on girl 69, girl on guy 69, girl gagging from the top 69. My God wasn't the Bible, but the collection of mutually occurring oral sex videos. When a chick popped my 69 cherry, I built up the situation too much. My neck hurt and it was hard to enjoy the blowjob with my nose in a, dr in a drunk chick's sweaty asshole. However, sometimes a fantasy exceeds expectation. A friend of mine told me getting whipped by a dominatrix would free me. He said the power exchange, the letting go of control was beyond words. After browsing a few pornos online, my cock remained hard long after orgasm. 69ing disappointed me, so my expectations were low. The dungeon didn't disappoint. The loss of power, being tied up, whipped, was more than I expected. I wouldn't go so far as to say it blew my dopamine receptors, but it was pretty good. $20 fee plus $50 on the Coke before, a solid night out. After watching a comedy, uh, after watching a comedy special peppered with ass-eating jokes, I wondered, was it all I was cracked up to be? Did ass-eating deserve more respect? I was young, but a pervert and a degenerate <laughs> training, and a good pervert does his homework. The asshole comprises some of the strongest muscles in the human body. Some thick repeat or extended anal penetration leads the asshole leads to the asshole getting bigger. Myth. The asshole muscles are like any other muscle. They develop memory. It's, it's recommended not to sit on a toilet for more than five minutes to prevent hemorrhoids. That's all well and good, but if you've, but if you've eaten some bad sushi or eaten that Taco Bell, you'll live on that motherfucker. More research led to uh, anal tumors and warts, and all that made my dick soft. I got the basics, hit up a gay friend for advice, and assumed getting my ass eaten would be easy since the chicks... I'd been with loved anal. Bro, he said, no chick is tongue in that filthy fucking hole. You eat ass? Sure, it's different. How? Listen, man, go with God or some shit, but I'm telling you that you'll, you'll need a real nasty bitch to lick your asshole. First mistake, being too forward with weird sexual requests. I say weird since I don't fancy ass eating as weird. A chick pissed on my head once and that seemed normal enough. I suppose, I suppose weirdness is relative. I was blasted out of my mind at a party and a blonde with a fat ass and juicy titties grabbed my crotch. Sounds good, right? Wrong. I pulled the trigger too soon. I, I asked if she'd lick, lick uh, my asshole and she called me a degenerate. Whatever. Word had it that she was into adult baby whatever the fuck fetish. Needless to say, I didn't get my ass eaten, nor did I get my dick sucked. Second mistake, expecting reciprocal ass eating. Next party, the sexy black chick drugged me upstairs after smoking some Willie Nelson style weed. She lit up a cigarette and shoved my crotch in her face and shoved her crotch in my face. Pheromones hit me as I peeled back her panties. Clean shaven, a clit like a Jolly Roger. This wasn't my first time eating pussy. A professional man whore developed certain skills. I started slow. Teasing with a few tongue flicks on the lips, then, tug, then, then tongue fucking her cunt. She moaned and grabbed my hair. That's the good shit, white boy, she said. Work that clit like a motherfucker. I transitioned to the clit, and despite the bucking hips, my lips lashed onto her pussy like an octopus. Faster, 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 she vice gripped my head. I'm a cum. 
Oh, fuck. Harder, harder. Harder, you filthy fuck. She pushed me away. She pushed me away and washed down and, and washed me down with her squirt. Fuck, what a night. I banged a lot of chicks, but this broad was the first squirter. She lay sprawled out like a like a car crash victim. I, and I took my cock out and shoved it in her mouth. Pro tip. The best cock sucking you'll ever get is after you make a chick blast you in the face. No, second best. The best blowjob is with is with a butt plug in your ass and a vibrating egg on your chode. Blow a, a blowjob like that will drain the dopamine from your brain. She was so good. She she uh, she was so good. I blew my nut in her mouth in seconds. A bit embarrassing, but I made up for it by flipping her over and tonguing her asshole. I finished. My turn. I slobbed on your knob. I know, but you know, I uh, think you could eat my ass. Her face soured. Fuck no. There could be dingleberries or some other nasty ass shit down there. I don't have dingleberries. My asshole is clean. I have it waxed. She grabbed her clothes and left. God damn it. All right, let's leave it there. Thank you for uh, putting up with all of that. I appreciate it. Oh. Thank you for uh, bringing George Bataille to the States. You know, that, again, was in... in, in it, you know, we, we got to see a huge selection of work from Outcast Press, and that was Sebastian Weiss, who is, again, the co-founder of Outcast Press, and who you can find on Twitter and Instagram at Outcast Press, O-U-T-C-A-S-T-P-R-E-S-S, -S, and also on Twitter at Sebastian underscore Weiss. Um, Sebastian's debut poetry book, Homo Mortalis, Meditations on Memento Mori, uh, came out in April 2022, and Flesh Merchants, Stories of Sex and Death is forthcoming in 2024. So thank you very much, Sebastian, and thank you for the Outcast Press representation. And we have um, one more uh, reader for the evening who I'm very excited to introduce. I'm always happy when we can have um, readers who return and, and share new stuff um, over time. Um, and Justin Karcher is coming back to performance anxiety after uh, too long. It's been too long, Justin. We've missed you terribly. Um, but I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. And Justin Karcher, who's on Twitter at Justin underscore Karcher, K-A-R-C-H-E. Hey, can, every, can everyone hear me? I'm like dramatically in my car cloaked in shadows. So I always find like a, a new place to like do this, uh, do this in. Um, it's also like 60 degrees in Buffalo, uh, New York, which feels like 90. Um, so I'm very excited. But can everyone hear me? Good. Take okay. it away. Uh, so let's see. So I wrote this. Uh, actually, I wrote this 20 minutes ago, uh, actually, before. Uh, the virtual uh, before the poetry thing. So I'm just going to read this since I walked around town for a while. And uh, I wrote this uh, about 10 minutes before uh, we started. Killing some time before a virtual poetry reading when I run into James Sahaki and while walking, we chat about the summer secondhand guitars that smell like fresh strawberries and a dance party that never ends. Sleeveless symphony seeds we plant when the days are darkest, how they bloom at the first sign of sunburn. Try not to itch and forget what has happened. The beautiful world beside the broken one. After we part, I get caught in a tidal wave of joggers all striving for self-improvement. I wonder what songs are stuck in their ears as I narrowly escape their heat wave and find a safe haven inside the 7-Eleven on summer. The irony doesn't escape me. I grab the coldest Red Bull I've ever felt and imagine the skull of a prehistoric penguin. I'm not sure why, maybe because my heart's a flutter and penguins like you and me fall in love. During courtship, a penguin will find a dope ass pebble. And if the other penguin digs it, they'll put it in the nest and together they'll just keep adding more pebbles until there's a mountain they can climb to to touch the future. So damn beautiful. There's a big smile on my face at the register. And when I ask for Marlboro Lights, shorts the cashier goes why does everyone only get these never the long ones after a bit of reflection i'm like nothing is meant to last forever i guess it's a friendly unhealthy reminder 
And I'm not sure what I mean by this, but it seems to do the trick. The cashier nods, mutters, yeah, and goes back to looking at their phone. Back on the outside, up the block, there's a dude just hanging around Uncle Jumbo's and telling everyone walking by, it's gorgeous out. His words waddle through the air and smack me across the face, knocking my teeth out. They scatter like pebbles all over the sidewalk. It feels good picking them up one by one as the sun dips below the horizon. Uh, So that's that one. I wrote that before we started. Um, This one is called, uh, I do a lot of theater, uh, so I run a theater company. We're actually, we opened a play uh, earlier tonight, Um, but this poem is called, We Wither Away Whenever Yellow is Worn. Autumn in the air, me and Dobin sitting on the bench in front of matinee, talking about the 48-hour film festival, when Rick comes up to us and dramatically declares, It's like a powder keg out here. He's not wrong. Lately, the theater district is more unhinged than maybe it should be. The whole city is. When the lights go down, mouthless monologues start crawling down the street, smashing the windows of parked cars. Everyone on edge, despite what they say. How, when you take a knife and carve open a memory foam mattress, you'll discover a broken heart pumping out shards of glass increasingly difficult to relax these days some winged horse always flying out of your news feed with a big bag of cocaine hanging out of its mouth when you think you've turned the corner you suddenly blow up like a bomb little pieces of who you thought you were scattered in all directions each one searching for that terrible beauty to make sense of things an excess of love would be nice but our long-legged murmurs are allergic to oxygen oxytocin they turn into silence by sweating so much they melt into nothing we never know what to say about ourselves anymore just that something is off so we keep on running we talk about revolution when we should be talking about resurrection because coming out of your shell isn't the thing you do once it's an everyday thing how you interact with the world around you walking the streets and collecting all the yellow police tape you can find wrapping that pain around your body from head to toe after leaving matinee i catch the caution we throw to the wind by the time i get back to west delavan i resemble a school bus bandaged up by blotters the selfless witching hour when i stand in front of the abandoned apartment building across the street from my house and stare down the graffiti rat hazard stands out because it's tattooed twice I perform a strip tease, classy but sensual, removing each piece of tape like I'm becoming a new person. Pretty soon there's a pile of entrails at my feet and all the windows are winking at me. In the pre-dawn hours, the powder keg is quieting down. Victory means not losing your mind when all signs point to yes. It means acknowledging the shitstorm but not giving in. It means fixing what's going on inside and never turning a blind eye. No one should stay allergic to the sunrise. How, when you take a knife and carve up a ghost, you'll discover all the things you wanted to say but never did. All right, there's that one. You know, whip through these. Um, so this one, I, I mean, it, it's inspired by Rock of Ages, that terrible musical. Um, but well, here it goes. It's called After the Wound Heals, We're Gonna Get Wild. Ever since I moved back to the Elmwood Village, I'm constantly wondering who's building this city. Always in a state of limbo, you can't tell anymore what's being constructed and what's being demolished. It depends on your state of mind, and I've got to take a little time to think things over. There's been heartache and pain running with the shadows. Some people I talk to, they're so tired of being broken that they become frozen in time, hanging on the promises and songs of yesterday. Eventually, they become streetlights. 
their shine no longer belongs to them. It's not like living in paradise, but I won't stop believing that someday this movie will end. Imagine just motoring along and doing the same old shit when suddenly you hear Buffalo cry out, I'm not going to take it. Then the sounds of a stampede, hooves on asphalt and overgrown grass, change has never been this fast. You quickly diffuse the love bomb you've been holding in your heart. You unpick a fight and stare down the long road to recovery. Thousands of inner sparks coming together as one, more alive than ever before. The street lights are on the move. It's also blinding and you can't see what's right in front of you, but you follow them anyway. Until you find yourself in a sleazy dive bar at the edge of the river, there's music everywhere, cowgirls using tweezers to pull out their splinters, hangmen in the bathroom softening their wrecking balls. What happens when you lose the beat and want it back, when you find yourself home again on a ship of fools, rocking and rolling and trying to get better every day? There's that one. All right, I'm going to read one more. Um... This one's called uh, they're, wa- Oof. they're Wrong When They Say Our Generation Doesn't Know How to Love. A somewhat morose way to take over a dinner party when Sam declares at the top of his lungs that America is dying of loneliness. But what other choice do we have? We stop eating as Sam gets up, goes into the one bedroom and drags out a mattress. He throws it onto the table like it's a casualty of war. Food and booze go flying in all directions. We're surprisingly unfazed as Sam then heads into the kitchen and comes back with a knife. This is hypnotherapeutic, he tells us, before plunging it against the box spring. He's a little off tonight because of the vodka. Nobody tells anybody to stop anymore. But that's beside the point. Apparently, this is some sort of ritual, marking up the mattress for every one night stand, all the bad dreams you need to remember. When Sam hands me the knife, I don't think twice and blurry friends from college pop into my head. They're murdering a white tailed deer out in the street. When the deed is done, my blurry friends remove the antlers, then fight over them until someone wins. The winner holds the antlers to their head and runs into this parked car over and over again as the blood on the ground slowly takes the shape of the face with heart eyes emoji. The room is silent until someone screams, you masochist. They're not wrong. And so I slink off my chair and curl into the fetal position on the cold floor. Every now and then, Sam comes over to rub my back. Feels so nice as I listen to all the loveless voices trying to break the sound barrier. Everyone confessing their dirty little secrets. What happens when you throw candy corn into the windows of an abandoned factory? How the persecuted sweetness runs headfirst into the asbestos arms of what we leave behind. Baptism, another storm, whatever. It all gets mixed together and weird looking monsters emerge from the rot. They have no idea what to do with their lives, floating in outer fuck, concocting drinks with rat poison and rainwater. Under the table they go with the rest of our baggage. As I get back on my feet, I see the mattress looks like a crime scene. Then Sam starts talking about these teenagers who didn't want prompt to end, so they stole a limo. They live there, Sam explains, and of course they're nuts and old now, but they drive around town and it's tempting, you might think, to hop in that limo when you see it stopped because you might want to experience those feelings frozen in time. Such innocence, right? But don't. I implore all of you not to because you won't make it out alive. Don't go looking for it. Don't think love is flat. Flat earthers in the bedroom, all doom and gloom, refusing to believe that love is round, how it moves in a circle until it gets back to you. I let this sink in for a moment, but then I'm like, um, Sam, if they stole a limo, what about their parents or the police? 
He bursts into tears and collapses onto the mattress where he starts fingering all our stab holes. And I can't help but think of when Jesus rose from the dead and Thomas had his doubts and Jesus pulled his robe back and displayed all his wounds. He was like, hey, Thomas, put your finger here. And Thomas did. All right. There's that poem. Uh, I, that, that's all I got. Thank you very much as I as I kind of cloak myself in shadow silhouettes. Um, but I enjoyed everyone reading and uh, it's uh, really nice to get to meet you. So thank you. Thank you, Justin, for the beautiful black box effect of the in-car reading and for those incredible poems. Uh, that was beautiful uh, from one doubting Thomas to this doubting Thomas saying that we have reached the end of our performance anxiety reading for April. This was amazing. Thank you so, so much to all of our readers for sharing your beautiful work with us this evening. Thank you too to our listeners, whether you're listening live in the call or uh, on YouTube, uh, to giving for giving this hour and a half almost of your lives over to poetry. Uh, we hope that you're, if you're listening with a sheaf of new poems or fiction or any new work that you'd like to share close at hand, you might consider dropping us a line at Performance Anxiety, Performance ANXT on Twitter. You can email Poetry Books on tape at gmail.com or tomsnarski at gmail.com. We would love to have you at a future event. Our next reading is going to be on May 18th. We'd love to see you there. And uh, to close tonight's reading, I always try to close with a poem. So I'm just going to close with a really, really short part of a poem called Memory by uh, Stephen Berg. It's from his book um, with Akhmadova at the Black Gates. In my book, Plantain, I said I kept silent for weeks. I sat on a stone by the sea. Quote, my last tie with the sea is broken, end quote. I saw the reddish moon enter the branches of a single pine, pass through, be there again between twigs, needles, until you stood near me. Glimmer of identity, soul, whatever makes men free. We touched, we became one voice, like a lover on whose face the sad accident of moonlight continues. <laughs>